Just speak your word into our hearts and have your way. Praise the Lord. You may be seated tonight just for a moment here and we'll have you stand, if you don't mind waiting just for a second here. I wanted to give you these prayer requests and a couple of announcements here uh, this evening to add to what uh, Brother Mitchell already uh, offered for us here. Good to have Mitchell back. Good to have the Vasakis here tonight. Always good to see them. Uh, great to have them here uh, tonight and each one of you. May God bless you. Uh, I know that Wednesday night is often a squeeze and we appreciate you. Uh, coming and being here. We're remembering uh, Brother Yvonne Carrion's granddaughter, uh, who's up in New York and uh, just having a, uh, quite a, she had quite a complex operation, and uh, therefore the uh, recovery is a tedious, slow kind of recovery, and um, we, uh, we assured him that we would remember that need before the saints. Uh, Sister Karen's, um, her, her daughter, uh, Caitlin, uh, her husband Clayton uh, is the father of Lincoln. And Lincoln's the little guy who's not a little guy anymore that we were praying for. And we were praying that he wouldn't be little for long. And he's gotten big and we're thankful for that. Um, but Clayton, who is the father of Lincoln, has uh, some condition that they're still trying to test and evaluate to see what's going on. He's lost 50 pounds since around Christmas. And uh, we, we sure want to remember that need, and Sister Karen asked us to, to remember that on behalf of the family, and uh, that's something that they're uh, doing tests on. They're hoping that, uh, Lord willing, they'll find some issue there. Uh, brother Elias in Tanzania, his brother passed away suddenly. Uh, suddenly he had, uh, they, they found out very quickly that uh, a little while ago that he had leukemia. And he didn't know it, and it was quite advanced when they found it. And it was a great loss to Brother Elias. He was very close to his, uh, to his brother. Sister Becky asked us to remember her um, relative, Judy Rodriguez, who's in Walter Reed Hospital, and she's got a serious uh, test going on and uh, uh, possibly a cancer situation. And so we, uh, we've been asked to remember her in prayer and also... Uh, Jeannie Fulcher, who is uh, a wife of Sister Becky's cousin, that we've been asked is also to remember her in prayer. Uh, I also said uh, today to our, our banker, we have a banker who works at one of the branches here in town, First Citizens Bank, and uh, she's been very helpful and very, uh, very um, uh, good resource for us in doing all the uh, many complex things that we do. And her name is uh, Michelle Nix. And uh, she actually is from Virginia, up near where uh, we live. But she lives here in town. And her husband is in intensive care. And I don't know many details about it, but I asked her today, I was talking to her about some things, and I asked her today, I said, would it be all right if I mentioned you guys and, and asked uh, the church to pray? And uh, she said that would be really good. And she said, by the way, I have three small children. She said, and if you don't mind, remember them. She's been going back and forth uh, to intensive care with her husband, in and out, in and out of intensive care. So I don't know what the, the issue is, but I, I assured her that we, would, uh, that we would pray. If you don't mind, bring up my PowerPoint here, and I wanted to just give you a couple of quick things here before we get into the Word. This is one of the families here from uh, Kirov, I forget how to pronounce it, uh, Kirovrod is how, how it's spelled here, uh, and this is... Uh, they're a little family who come from a war-torn area of Ukraine. Now, if, a lot of people have asked me about the headlines, you know, saying, well, you know, is Russia pulling back and is Russia giving up? Uh, this is the way I, I consider uh, the Russian government. If their lips are moving, uh, we know what it is. It's probably a lie. If their lips are not moving, they're still trying to deceive somehow. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's not a ceasefire until they stop firing. And it's not a cessation of war until they stop shelling. And so I was talking to the believers today uh, on the phone. And I'm also going to minister to them tomorrow afternoon from my house. And uh, they were saying that, you know, the, in the uh, background they said air raid signals are still going off in all different parts of the country. 
This is one little family, and we're finding these little families, little pockets of believers who are moving around, and we were able to get some support to them. They, they sometimes wind up in an area where a banking system works that we can uh, use to get money to them. And so uh, I, I, I don't know these people, but uh, they were very appreciative of the funds that uh, reached them. So with the believers who are uh, watching and know where uh, these, these folks are moving around, it's a great help and uh, we're able to still channel funds. So that's still ongoing. That's still a process that happens every day that uh, we put money in the hands of people who are able to put money in the hands of people, and uh, they are very, very appreciative of that because if you've been in Ukraine since the war started and you're still there, I will assure you that you've probably run out of resources by now. So these folks have nothing and uh, have used up any kind of savings. They probably left, and these folks have left their home, gone to another area, and so the support that's channeled to them is a great help. Wanted to give you just two pictures here as well. Brother Anwar sent me this just before uh, church uh, this evening here, and this is uh, the 70 Weeks of Daniel, and it has uh, three sermons in there, and uh, they're all finished and ready for distribution, so they're all uh, pretty excited about uh, the, the new books that are coming there. And Brother Amar, just, he just stays at it and just uh, constantly translates uh, for the people over there, and they're excited to have the materials. Let's stand to our feet, and uh, let's take our Bibles tonight. We're going to look in Psalm 119. And uh, thank you, musician, we let you take your places there. And uh, we'll read the scripture, and then we'll have a word of prayer together. Psalm 119, Psalm 119 has a little section which begins with each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so we come down to verse 105, very common scripture. Thy word, David writes, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I have sworn I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and the promises that uh, have been so made so real to us, Lord, in this last day. We are a people, Lord, who are dependent upon you, and we look to you as a God who is full of resources, and you have great abundance, Lord, of uh, not only natural things, because you're the God of creation, but, Lord, you're also the God of revelation. You're the God of your own word. And, Lord, we depend upon you to unlock it for us and to help us to see and understand. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have given us great insight uh, in the times we live in to know exactly where we are in your timeline, but also, Lord, uh, to know which direction we should be going. And we're so very grateful for that. Now, Lord, these other needs that have been mentioned, Lord, and some that are quite serious, we place them into your hands, Lord, with all that Mitchell brought to us tonight and Brother Mark's already prayed. And Lord, the very best thing we can do is just bind all of these things together and lay them at the foot of the cross and just ask, oh God, that you would be merciful to each one. You always have a solution, and your solutions are always best. Now, Lord, as we study the word, I pray that you would take it, and Lord, feed our hungry souls. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You may be seated tonight. God bless you. <clears throat> I've had the privilege over uh, my years to be able to travel to Alaska. And uh, Alaska is quite an interesting place because uh, a lot of people don't realize really how far away it is. But it is quite a ways out there. And a lot of people don't realize how rugged it really is. You know, when you look at the pictures of Alaska, it looks so pristine and you know, the majestic mountains and the animals and so forth. And, uh, you know, it looks, it looks really nice. And it is really nice. I mean, it's a special place. It's certainly a unique place, but it's rugged and it's rough. But one of the interesting things about Alaska is the way that uh, daylight operates there. And uh, when you go, the first time that Sister Becky and I went, we went in uh, November. It was towards the end of November. And... It never really got light at all. It was, uh, it was dark until about 10 or 11 o'clock, and then it got this gray sort of, 
and then uh, it stayed that way until about 3, 30, 4 o'clock, and then it started to get dark again, and it never really got light. I see the Alaskans shaking their heads. Uh, and it, it was, uh, even, even if the weather was nice and clear, it was still, there was a dullness about it. And you could, uh, you could kind of see the, uh, you know, the response of the people in, in, that, in that condition, because we are affected by light. Uh, all of us are, in our, in our natural makeup. But then the other, uh, the other side of the coin was interesting, too, because I was up there in the summer. We wound up going up in, uh, I, I know Peter was with me and a couple of other young fellows that were there. And we went to, uh, uh, we were in uh, Anchorage, and we had gone out to the villages, but we were in Anchorage for most of the time. And it was right at the solstice, which is the longest day of the year, at the end of June. And my goodness, what an opposite effect it was. It was light all day, bright and sunny, and uh, 12 o'clock, midnight, sunny. Uh, you know, and uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, it got a little dull, and then uh, it, it swung back around 5 o'clock in the morning, sunshine again. And it was really interesting because... Uh, the, the whole reaction of people was quite different during the, uh, during the summer months in Alaska. And people would, uh, uh, I know that some people were telling us they went to play golf. And they just played, for the, the, you, could, you could rent the clubs and play for 24 hours, because you could. You could just play all day and all night. And uh, lots of people spent their day and night fishing. Uh, you know, they could go out in the morning and they could just bring food with them and go out all day long and stay all night long and fish. Never got too dark to do anything and it was really great. Uh, if you were trying to sleep, it was not so great uh, because the construction crews were out there as well all night because they could work in the daylight. Uh, and Eskimo people are a little bit funny because they had this strange habit of putting tinfoil over the windows in the summer months. And uh, the tinfoil lock kept the light out. It, was, it made the room dark, but it also reflected the heat into the room. And so you were half-baked by the time you uh, got up in the morning. I mean, you were, you were well-roasted by the time you got up. It was really different. You had to, you were, whether you were in the, in the November time or whether you were in the June months, you had to adjust quite a lot. But they did tell me this, that when the people up there... Uh, you know, lots of tourists come in the, in the June months. They love to be there for the solstice and the longest day. Many of them say, boy, I am moving here. This is fantastic. I mean, we can, we can play all day and play all night, and this is, this is really fantastic. And I'm, I'm moving here because this seems like a whole lot of fun. And lots of people do. They say lots of people pack up. They go home, sell everything, pack up, and come back to Alaska. And the, the Alaskans, the locals, they always say the same thing. We wait until around April and see how they're doing. And sure enough, by the time April comes and they're so fed up with the darkness, they're selling everything they have and moving back down to the mainland because uh, that adjustment is really hard. It goes from one extreme to the other. And we don't realize how, uh, how much light really affects us. And so tonight, I want to talk a little bit about this subject of light. I heard another story uh, from somebody who was telling me that uh, they were in the great blackout of, in New York in 2003. And that was when uh, it was a series of uh, uh, sections of the power grid that started in Canada, near, up near Toronto, and it, and it triggered a collapse of the grid. Some of you are shaking your heads, you remember. I remember that very well. And uh, they shut down major airports all along the east, eastern seaboard and in New York and so forth. And this one uh, fellow, I heard him tell the story of how that he was in New York and LaGuardia actually uh, was shut down. They were all standing around waiting for their luggage. And, uh, you know, or sorry, they were sitting on the plane. They were waiting to get off. And they said, finally, the pilot came on and said, hey, we can't let you off because there's no power. And so if there's no power. We can't get your luggage to you. There's a whole lot of things we can't do. But eventually, they had to let, let them off the plane. They got off. And uh, they, uh, they got a hold of somebody on a cell phone. And the only hotel room that they had was in this Crown Plaza that was near the hotel. And uh, when they finally got there, uh, being the last room, they, they gave, were giving out flashlights in the lobby for people, and it was hot and sweaty in, uh, you know, in New York City, and 
they were making their way, uh, walking up the stairway with their luggage, and they finally got to the room where, uh, where, where they were uh, given. It was the last room in the hotel. There was no facilities they had, just a little bit of water running. And, you know, they were, they were thankful for a bed, but it, it, was, it was a rough situation. The wife happened before they, they turned in. She, she happened to open up the curtains and look out the window. When she did, right in the, in the midst of all the darkness, here was a great big Marriott hotel right next to hers, and all the lights were on in the whole hotel. And uh, she looked out the window, and she said to her husband, hey, take a look at this. And here's all these people with air conditioning. The restaurants are all running. Everything is just like normal. All around, every other building is in total blackness. So they, they just looked at each other. They repacked their bags, went down the stairs, went over to the Marriott, and got a, uh, got a room there. And they were just excited about that. And uh, I mean, it was just great. But the fellow asked the manager before they went up to the room, they said, what is it about you play, you, this place? I mean, uh, you, have, uh, you have power when no one else does, and you're, you're a light in the midst of all this darkness. And, and the manager said, when we built this hotel, we thought the very best thing we can do is have a generating system that would sustain us in a power outage. He said, it doesn't happen very much, but when it does happen, it's really, really hand, handy for us. And this is the line that he gave this brother. He said, he said, the neat thing about this, he says that what happens in here is not dependent on what happens out here. We are not ruled by the darkness or the elements out here. So they had something internally, they had something within that kept the power on and kept the lights on. Now, I, I, I say that because I want you to be familiar with one principle tonight, and we'll study that and then begin to develop that, uh, that little principle as we move through the scriptures. So I wanted to do a very simple uh, study here tonight with you. And all of these scriptures will be familiar, but I want you to take note of them. Paul, or sorry, John writes in 1 John, This then is the message that we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness... We lie and do not the truth. So you cannot walk contrary to the light of God in your life and say that you are a, a, a child of light or a child of God. You can't do it. But here's the principle. He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, in other words, you're walking according to the current truth or the current light that God is manifesting, then he says, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So your fellowship or your communion with one another and your communion with God and the blood of Jesus Christ is all dependent on whether you're walking in the light as he's in the light. It isn't just walking in natural light. And the, the parallels are really obvious. I mean, he's the creator of, of natural light. He's the creator uh, of, uh, you know, the, the lights we enjoy and the, the firmament and the stars and everything else. But he's also a, a creator of spiritual light or spiritual truth. So let's say it this way. In the Old Testament, the word itself was light. Like David wrote back here in Psalm 119, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And David said uh, uh, in, in another place in Psalm 119, he said, thy, thy word... Uh, that uh, thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. And so they, they understood that the word was true and the word was right. And they committed it, you know, uh, they, they committed themselves to it. And the word was the, uh, the instruction. It contained the instructions that they needed. It, was, uh, it, it helped define the boundaries that they needed to live within. It helped them to understand what pleased God and what didn't please God. And they lived as much as they could by the letter of that word because they knew it was right. Now, I mean, it's amazing. These were, uh, you know, when you go back in Scripture, these were men of character. For instance, when we think about Joseph in the book of Genesis, uh, he has this occasion with Potiphar's wife that he resists because he knows, according to the word, that this is a, uh, this is a, a wrong uh, relationship. This is a wrong interaction. And so therefore, there's no way I can rightly do this and stay in continuity with God's word. 
He says, how can I have, uh, sin against my master? How can I sin against God? And he asked that question to Sister Potiphar, and of course she wasn't, you know, uh, she wasn't uh, impressed by that at all. But uh, that's what Joseph did. He knew enough of the word, and he was a man of character because God had trained him over those years to know that, hey, that's in the word, that's clearly wrong. It's outside the boundaries, so I'm going to avoid that. And the word is a lamp unto our feet. But in the New Testament, there's a, a switch and this is what I want you to really try to understand. In the New Testament, we see that the word being lived out is light. When the word is lived out, it becomes light. When the word is actually made flesh, that becomes light for our day. John 1, 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So the word, that's the difference now. It's not just something that we have as a list of, of uh, rules to follow. It's not just a bunch of commandments that we have to keep in mind. It's not just checking the list and saying I've done everything right. But rather it is a word that has been translated or if you like transformed into a life that you live and that life becomes the light of the world. Wow. So therefore... And if you're, I mean, at the end of the day, this creates, in a sense, a great and a high responsibility for every one of us if we claim to be children who are walking in the light in this last day. Then people have the opportunity to look at you and see, they should be able to see that word being lived out of your life and be able to recognize, hey, they have, a different, they have a different spirit about them. They have a different way about them. They have a different affect about them. They have a different kind of conduct than most other people. And this is, this is the idea that's being expressed here. It's not because we followed all the rules today, but Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's something internal. It's something very personal to a person when the word is living out of their life. And therefore, it's not me anymore, but it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. In John 5, uh, Jesus was referring to John, and he says, John was a burning and a shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. And there was no greater prophet than uh, the prophet John. But John brought a light to the world. He brought a message to the world, but then eventually the word was made flesh. And so there was a, a corner that was turned there. All right, let's follow that. Let's study that principle a little bit, because I think it's a great one. When, when Simeon, who we quoted there, uh, he was making the, uh, the pronouncement over Jesus. He was quoting out of Isaiah 49. He said, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my, mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So Isaiah prophesied this, that I will give thee the Savior to be a light to the Gentiles. Uh, it, it, was not, it was not just a new commandment that he was giving to them, but he was now going to uh, be an embodiment of the word that the word could actually walk and live among them and express itself. And this would be somebody in the image of God. And he said that salvation may be made known. Now, <clears throat> Paul, uh, and, and this is what's, to me, this is what's challenging. It's one thing to know God is requiring something. And, and there are many things in Scripture that God requires. How we do that is a little more challenging. How we fulfill what God is requiring is a challenge that all of us need to think about. Because you can know what God wants. You can know what God expects. You can know what God forbids. You can know where the lines are. And that's a good thing. But how you actually perform that in a way that pleases God, that's what I always like to know. Lord, how, if it says, uh, you know, that uh, we should, uh, you know, turn the other cheek and go the extra mile and give him your cloak also, well, what does that really mean? What is God's intent when he says something like that? And then how do we perform that? How do we do that in a way that's pleasing to God and not self-serving? You know, so we would uh, get the honor for that. And, and th this, this, uh, this uh, teaching or this instruction, uh, I think, is important. But if you watch the pattern, if you watch the way that God reveals his word, this prophecy was given uh, by Isaiah, and Simeon picks it up and says, I will also give thee a light to the Gentiles, speaking of Christ. And then in the early church, Paul begins to demonstrate how this is going to actually play out. 
In Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it off from you, lo, we turn, and, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath God commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. So therefore, now here's the same anointing or the same uh, process of fulfillment, if you like, that all, stems all the way from Isaiah and falls, is pronounced over Jesus, and now the Spirit of Christ is in the church because all God was was poured into Christ. Isn't that right? And all that Christ was, he poured into the church. So now, here is the, here is the light of the Lord, uh, it, and he, he's referring to uh, the light of the Gentiles. It'll be manifested in the church, and Paul is the first one here that draws attention to this. So all I'm saying is this. Let's look at what Paul says about this, because that's going to be pretty instructive. He's got, he's got this anointing or the reality that the Lord has commanded us, saying, I've set thee to be a light to the Gentiles. You know what? It's no longer Jesus the man, right? Jesus is not here standing here in front of you now manifesting the, the, the word of God, the word made flesh. But you know what? It's in the church now. And the church are the people who are living this out. And so therefore, let's look at what Paul taught in order for us to grasp how we can continue uh, this manifestation of the light of God uh, through God's people. Now, Brother Branham, in the Feast of the Trumpets here, he refers to this and he said, now, uh, how will the people that's believing him, and that's us, right? We're, we're believers. He said, how are the people that are believing him going to know it unless they're constantly into, in the word to know what he is? I believe that um, someone who was uh, recently here, and it, it must have been, uh, I think, Brother Diggs who was recently here, uh, was talking about this element of faith here. And I think it's really important for us to make sure that we provide the means whereby people's faith will grow. It'll, it'll increase. Telling people they don't have faith is not a good way to get people to have their faith increased. Faith does not come by uh, rebuke. Faith comes by hearing. And so therefore, uh, it, it, would be, uh, it would be logical that people who are constantly being corrected or constantly being uh, challenged uh, to perhaps you know, be, uh, I, I guess I'm struggling for a way to say this, uh, to be on the, on the weak side of faith because they're constantly... Uh, hearing something that is uh, causing them to examine themselves in a, uh, in a negative way and, and in, a, in a way that, uh, you know, they would feel less confident about themselves and their own experience with God. I think it's important for us to edify and to build up people. There are times when uh, we admonish, there's times when we correct, and there's times when we deal with things, you know, that, uh, that arise, and that always will be the case. But really our goal is to get people from here to there. Right? I've said several times in the last few days that I said it at the men's breakfast that we had, is that the process that we're a part of, the process that we men are a part of, is to make boys into men and make men into better men until God is finished with us and takes us over on the other side. And that process is not a, not a one-shot deal or a one-convention deal. That is something that is ongoing in our lives. It's something that happens continuously. And Brother Branham is telling us that in order for the people who profess to believe him, uh, how are they really going to know unless they're constantly in the word to know what he is? Well, let me tell you what one of the problems that we face in our world is that there's so many other things out there that are more attractive or they're more uh, entertaining. They're, uh, they're very entertaining. They're very, uh, you know, they, they kind of draw you in. They pull you in. There's lots of things that are within reach of every one of us. Uh, who we can be di diverted by. And I'm not saying that they're all evil things, but there's lots of other things in, in your day uh, that, uh, that will attract your attention. They'll, they'll draw you in. It's only when we realize the full value of what God's revealed to us in the last day do we stand and say, hey, all of that stuff is there and it's available, but you know what? What God has given to us in his word is better than all of that. And I value that very highly. 
Yeah, that's there. And, you know, the human spirit needs to, to relax and all of that. And I understand all of that. We're all, we're all human. We're all, uh, you know, stressed to death and everything else. But I think when a person has a real revelation of the value of the word of God in this hour that God's given to us, because it is a word that as it increases, it will be so strong, it'll eventually affect the cells of your human body, and you'll be changed, and you'll be taken out of here in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And that's a promise that we can count on. You may not feel like that tonight. You may only feel like, uh, I need rest, or I need sleep, or I never had supper. We never got all our homework done. You may be sitting there thinking that, pondering that. You may be thinking, well, we need a new car. We need this. We need something else. And in the natural, that's, that's, that's a normal way for us to process the things that happen in the run of a day. God's not going to condemn you for that. I think that, that, that the thing that God really wants to see in your heart is a real true appreciation for the word that he brought to us in this last day and for you valuing that in the right way. And Brother Bram said, how are the people that's believing him going to know unless they're constantly in the word, in the word to know what he is? Because the more, we, uh, the more we look, the more we understand. The more we understand, the more we realize how great he is. But, and the more we, the more uh, the greatness we see in him, the, we, we also see this connection between us and him. And that's an exciting thing. But you'll never appreciate that unless you look. And that's what he's encouraging us to do. We look into the word as often as we can. And Daniel said, the wise shall know, but the foolish, the unwise, they wouldn't know. And now he shall appear in the last day. How he shall appear in the last day is to bring people back to the word so the bride will know her husband and know her mate, the revealed word. That's what God's, that's what God's doing, is to bring us back to the revealed word. And we're living in the age that his coming will be in, and a woman must be identified with her husband for the two are one. And Christ's bride has to be identified with him for the two are one. And he's the word, not the denomination, but he's the word. All right. Here's the words in black, all right? Bold letters. We are to be children of the light. And the light is the word which is made light for this age. We are to be children of the light. He's talking about us. We are to be children of the light. And the light is the word which is made light for this age. Where? Not in Brother Branham anymore, right? Because he's not here. But that word goes from letter to life in us. It goes from a letter to a reality in us. And how do we know light? Except it comes from the word. Now remember I told you a little while back, where is the light shining today? The light's not shining on any one individual. It's not shining on any one church. It's not shining over Brother Bram's grave. Let me tell you, the light today is shining over the word. So that you can look at it and have understanding. You can have vision and you can see what it's actually describing. So it's not just a natural light, a spotlight, but the light is actually giving you an illumination of what you need to know in the hour that you're living in. Because otherwise, you would be like, uh, like Brother Bram's talking about here uh, in, the, in the little previous section. He said, he's the word, not the denomination. So if, if the denominations have laid aside the word and they've taken a, uh, you know, their own creed and their own dogma, they may value that highly, but there's no light shining on it because it's not the word. The light, the light today shines on the word, right? And it gives us an understanding. And he says, and we are to be the children of the light, and the light is the word which is made light for this age. And how do we know light except it comes from the word? He said, the word made flesh is the light of the age when you see it. And this is something that God has to do. This is something that God does for us and uh, lays, it, lays it in store for us and gives us the understanding. He says, ye are the salt of the earth, and the, it, it, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. I got a question for you. Was he referring to the scribes and Pharisees? Was he referring to the denominational people of his day, which were the scribes and Pharisees? Absolute, absolutely not. Because uh, he, he said to them, he said, outward ye appear a certain way, but inward, he said, you're just full of darkness. Right? Full of death and darkness. So, therefore, they could not be the light that's set on the hill uh, that he's prophesying of, but he's talking about how that this process is going to move from him into the body of Christ, and they would become the, the light of the world, just like Jesus said, I am that light. Are we okay? We were at a, a re, my wife and I were at a restaurant um, last year, and uh, the restaurant was called Salt. 
And uh, I, I, it was not a chain. It was just a, a private place that we had discovered. And it was really nice. I mean, it was just it was a nice place. And uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole menu was geared around uh, having, uh, having uh, meals that could be enhanced with, uh, with salt. What, what kinds of, what, uh, the salt you sprinkle over, what, what is the name for it? Finishing salt. Yeah, thank you. And uh, they, they uh, I ordered, I, I think it was a steak or something that I ordered, and based on the kind of steak that you had, they brought you a little, just a little thimble full, like a little cap full of finishing salt, and you just sprinkle that on your food. You didn't cook with it. It was just a finished flavor. And, and because it was a special kind of salt, it enhanced the flavor of it. It was like, uh, it was not just an ordinary steak, like, whoa. It was like, you know, you stand up on your feet, and you're, you're trying to get everybody's attention around you, like, whoa, hey, folks, if you don't mind, can I have your attention just for a minute here? I mean, that's the a, that's a kind of effect that it had. It just enhanced the food. Well, I didn't realize, I mean, I was a novice when it came to salt. The only thing I understood about salt is that uh, two things. It'll, it'll drive your blood pressure up, supposedly. And then secondly, there is salt water and fresh water, and that's the only two things I know about salt. And so they were telling us that everything that you eat can be enhanced by this finishing salt. So in the end of it, they had a little sample of desserts and they had ice cream. Yeah, they brought out a finishing salt for ice cream. And like where I'm on my feet, you know, looking around the restaurant saying, is anybody else eating this? I mean, this is really outstanding. Salt is good for nothing if it doesn't enhance. And Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. And uh, God put us in uh, the earth as the salt of the earth in order to, uh, you know, to enhance uh, this, this. It's not just commandments, and it's not just going to church, and it's just not just laboring under rules and regulations and laws and commandments here, and have I done everything right, and, uh, you know, being under the condemnation of the law. That's not what it's about. But now God has actually, uh, you know, indwelt a people, and this is what Jesus is prophesying of, he's actually going to indwell a people that will become something really outstanding and attractive to the rest of the world. And when they get a hold of it, hey, listen, I went, you know, naturally, I went right to the store after dinner. And they had all kinds of salt there. I bought one for everyone in the house. Uh, I bought a salt bowl and salt for everybody in the house. I got one for the trustees here. I got one for the deacons here. Uh, hey, watch your stocking next December. I'll, I'll prob we'll probably do it for everybody. I mean, it was, it was, uh, I mean, it was, it was special. And Jesus said, ye are that. I'm going to put something in you that makes the word go from uh, just uh, facts and history and, uh, you know, commandments and memorizing. I'm going to go from that to people who actually live it. And they love it when they live it. And they, they're not forced to come to church and they're not forced to follow uh, the guidelines of the word and they're not, they're not being pressured to conform. Uh, that's not it at all. Just you can let them go and let them go anywhere in the world. You can let them uh, work in any occupation. You can uh, put them on any mission field at all. And at the end of the day, they'll still love the word of God because we're not in this for what we can get. We're not in this because uh, we have to. We're not in this because somebody's got a, a rule book or a ruler uh, to knock us on the, on the knuckles. That's not why we follow. That's not why we follow the Lord. I, I'm not following the message because I'm afraid of punishment. I don't know about you. If we're following the message because of that, we're following for the wrong reason. We're not following because of Brother Branham the man. I thank God for Brother Branham the man, but I'm not following Brother Branham. You know what? God took him home. He's gone. And I'm not following, listen, I, I don't want you to be offended, but I'm not following the message because of you. And I hope you're not following the message because of me. If, if we had time, and it would be in any way edifying, I could list for you all the mistakes I made today. They're very fresh, and they're very real. You don't want to hear them because you probably got just as many as I do. I don't know. But, I, hey, listen, we're, we're not following because of our human perfection. We're not following because uh, we want to have a following. We're not, that, that isn't it at all. There's something in us that believes the word. And you know what? God has made the word alive to us. He was salt to me. I become salt to the world. 
Oh, if I could, I'd love to make people thirsty. If I, if I could, I'd love to make people impressed with, uh, you know, our, our conduct and our, our speech and our, our services and all of that. I, I'd love to do that. And Jesus said as well in the same breath, he says, you are the light of the world. And if we take our definition, ye are the word made flesh now. I'm gone, but I will be back even in you. The world won't see me, but you'll see me. And you'll actually be light. And then Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You should be thankful that God, that the light has, has reached you. Because there are lots of people in this world whose minds are blinded. And you can tell they are. I remember years ago we were sitting in a minister's meeting up in Canada and there was somebody, a representative of the first 21 full gospel businessmen people leaders who were there. That was a group of 21 uh, ministers and, and famous men who got together and started the full gospel businessmen's organization. And uh, most of them had passed on because they were seniors when they started the organization. Of course, they were friendly to Brother Branham, and they invited Brother Branham, and he spoke at their conventions, and they were sort of interdenominational. So uh, it was easy for him to blend in with them because he, you know, he was not going to offend the Pentecostals and the Baptists and so forth. So he, he, that, I believe God created that as an avenue or a, 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 you know, a vector for him to be able to travel and, and minister. And he, hey, listen, some of the greatest sermons we have were preached at full gospel businessmen's meetings, you know, in, in cafeterias and in hotels. And, uh, you know, we're very thankful for that. And uh, we were at this minister's meeting, and, and uh, one, of the, uh, one of those founding members came and agreed to be interviewed so that we could hear his testimony of being with Brother Branham and uh, what the meetings were like and his stories and what he saw, what he experienced. And... Uh, with all due respect, and I don't say this disrespectfully at all, it was, ama it was absolutely amazing to us how he knew about the miracles, how he saw what he saw, and saw the supernatural happen, but had no, absolutely no understanding, really, of who Brother Branham was or what Brother Branham actually brought. He stopped at the supernatural. I'm not saying that negatively or critically. Uh, he was an observer. And he was being very sincere in telling us what he saw. But, he, but he, his, his experience with Brother Bram stopped right there. He saw the miracles, but he went on in his faith and he went on in his religion. In other words, what Brother Branham said did not affect him. And I believe it was because he was shut off to the light that God reserves for the elect. And I'll tell you, that's a lofty thing to say. And I, 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 I don't say that, hey, we're something else. You know, I, I, by God's grace, we, we are able to see that light. And let me tell you, that light is what guides us now. Because the word is a lamp unto our feet, isn't it? And so I, to be able to see what we see and to be able to move forward like we are in a world that's filled with darkness and growing, increasing darkness and blackness over the world, uh, I, I'll tell you what, I'm so glad that I don't have to consult Google or I don't have to listen to a, a, an elected leader or I don't have to uh, listen to some man's theory about what's next and where we're going and how this winds up. We already know. Hey, we've seen the light, Right? That's why Paul says in verse 5 here, we preach not ourselves. We don't preach our gifts. We don't, we don't manifest ourselves or project ourselves, but rather we project Christ the Lord uh, and ourselves, your servants, for, for Jesus' sake. Because preaching, preaching my gifts is, is totally unprofitable, but the word is able to save. So in the God of this evil age, Brother Bram said, that's what the word of God is. It is a light that shines in darkness. That's what the word is. It is a light that shines in darkness. And if that's true, if that's true, by our definition, you are that light. So when you go to school, you represent Christ. You are a light, even if it's a little light. You know the mini lights that you, know, you hang on your tree or the, the mini lights that you put in your window or the mini light. My wife will take a little lantern, you know, the little small lanterns, and she has a little coil of lights in there. They're really small, and she has a little battery that, that goes on there. And every light is really small. Wind them together, and you got yourself a nice, uh, nice decor. But they're all really little lights. Some of us are really little 
light. But you're still a light. Because your inclusion in heaven does not depend on how many lumens you project. You just got to be full of light. And if I'm only little and I don't have a big ministry and I don't have a big job and nobody hardly remembers my name and all of that, let me tell you, if you're full of light, you know, you should be very thankful for that. Because it's that light that matters. It is a light that shines in darkness. And when you take uh, a noise in the room, it sounds mysterious. You don't know what it is. But turn on the light and quickly to crickets and roaches. They're children of the darkness. And when the light flashes, they scatter away. They went out from us because they wasn't of us. The Bible said they cannot live in the light of the word. Now let me stop and say this, because I, you know, I've, I've heard this verse misused quite a lot. Some people say, you know, if they leave a church, oh, they went out from us because they were not of us. You know, they could easily very well be believers, but something might have went wacky. Something, they might have been offended, or something happened that was, uh, you know, um, out of season for them. And, I mean, there are people even who leave churches and, and move on to another area because they're led to do that. So we can't always say that because somebody's not in this church, oh, they went out from us because they're not, they're not of us. I will say that people that would walk away from the truth and build a website against it and begin to attack it and throw mud at it, discredit the prophet, discredit the people who follow it, those are people who cannot live in the light of God's word. There's something repulsive about that light. Because one thing is for sure, the devil does not like the light. That's for sure. He does not like the truth. He does not like what the light shows. For the God of heaven has sent his light in the last days that he might lighten the path for his children, that they might not walk in darkness and stumble. Aren't you glad? That God has illuminated your pathway, that they might walk in the light of the shining of Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God of heaven has sent his light in this last day, because he knew you were here in this last day still, that he might lighten the path for his children, that's you, that they might not walk in darkness and stumble, but they might walk in the light of the shining of Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And now when we see him, we see him in all of his glory. We see him in all of the facets of his uh, beauty and his strength. It's absolutely a wonderful thing uh, in, in the way that we are able to see him. Now, I want to, if you don't mind, let's take your Bible. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 here. And this is not on the screen, so this is where you kind of need to do it, the manual method. 2 Thessalonians. Thessalonians chapter 3. Everybody say this. I love my Bible. I'm glad we have a Bible. I want you to watch a little bit of the Paul, the Pauline teaching. If we are light, if we are salt, here's how it's done. And this is really great. Chapter 3, Paul writes, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. It may be like waters of a river. Waters of a river will continue to flow. And may, Lord, the word have free course among us. <clears throat> Drop down, if you will, to verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. Two words there are important. When Paul says withdraw, he says we're going to refrain from discourse. I'm just telling you what those words mean now. That we, he says, we are going to refrain from argument. We're going to refrain from butting heads with somebody from every brother that walketh disorderly. And that word disorderly means God's established way. God has a boundary. God has uh, a message of holiness. God has a, a way for the people of God. And he says, when we walk disorderly, so in other words, if somebody insists that it's okay to cut your hair because it doesn't matter what's on the outside, it's all on the inside. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, they're, they're making the scripture contradict itself. And you know what? 
you're probably better off. I mean, we can tell them what the, the Bible says. You can show them what Brother Branham says because Brother Branham mentions it in just about every single sermon. And there comes a point in time where you realize the only thing I can do is withdraw because I'm not going to spend my time arguing because butting heads generally only tells us who's got the harder head. And it doesn't tell us much else. So withdraw or refrain from discourse from every brother that walketh outside the established order and not after the tradition which he received of us. All traditions not bad. Traditions that are given by the apostles were good. I believe traditions that were given by Brother Brandon were good. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. We know what disorderly is, and we haven't done that. And neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any one of you. And then he, he continues to talk about work and how that we worked. We were not here to uh, sponge off you and you know, take money from you because you have money in the church. That was not the idea, but we worked and supported ourselves. Verse 11, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. He seems to be focused on this particular theme here. And working not at all, but are busybodies. They are listening all the time to things that they're hearing about other people and being quick to tell it. And they're neglectful of the duty that they have been given themselves. So therefore, Paul says now, them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Most people in a church are doing the right thing or wanting very much to do the right thing. They want to live right. They want to focus on the right things. They want to spend their energy on the right thing. They're trying to become what God wants them to, to, uh, to be. And he says, for you that are, uh, uh, that are uh, well-doing, he says, don't be weary of that. Don't draw back from that. Just because something else happens. Just because somebody else goes wacky. Just because there's disorderly people that you know, doesn't mean that, you should follow that. Don't be weary in well-doing. Pursue the thing that is good and right in the eyes of God. And if any man not obey our word by this apostle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Notice now, not that we're trying to push anybody down, not that we're trying to remove anybody, but watch what he says. He says, we count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So if there's correctability, let's do it. But let's do it the right way. Let's do it with gentleness. Let's do it according to the word. Take your Bible now and go to Colossians, the first chapter. This is, this is still Paul. Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. God comes to me for me, but he comes on me for you. Let me say that again. God comes to me for me, but he comes upon me for you. He anoints something that's in me that I might be able to exhort the people. He doesn't come on all of you in the same way that he would come on me because you're not all preachers and pastors, right? But God will come to me but he'll, for me, but he will come on me for you. And this is what Paul is saying, that I'm made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me. God comes upon me for you to fulfill the word of God. And so God wants to convey something to the body, so he anoints a man to bring a message, to bring light to them. And in that light, they fulfill God's word for that particular age. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, when I referred to uh, that little uh, monologue about faith and how uh, you know, uh, an appreciation of the value of the message has got to be greater than the entertainment that's out there in the world. This is what Paul is talking about, that, we would, that God would make known to us what the riches of the glory of this mystery really is. So if you find, if you find that listening to a sermon or reading through a sermon book or reading your Bible is laborious, and I'm not saying you're evil because you may feel that, and we're just kind of being honest, because it's better to be honest than dishonest in church. 
You should ask God to give you an appreciation of the great mystery that has unfolded for me in all of this. Lord, make it real to me. Make it alive to me. Pour salt on it for me that I might look at it and say, wow! And you know what? You want to tell somebody else about it. Right? Like me in the salt restaurant. You want to, you want to uh, you know, share this with everybody. Everybody ought to have this. It's so great. Everybody ought to have it. And so if we lack that, if we lack an enthusiasm, or if we lack a passion for the word itself, then we should ask God to, Lord, make that manifest to me in such a way that I could see that there's a glory in this. There's a, there's a powerful impact in, in, in really seeing what this message teaches and that's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So whom we preach, he said, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. Here's the goal. Here's the purpose, that we may present every man perfect in Christ. The goal is not to have the biggest church. And the goal is not to have accomplished a whole lot of things. But the goal is to be able to allow the word of God to flow through me to you and through God's ministry to the body so that It'll affect the body, and it'll, it'll make them what God intends them to be. God does not want you to languish in your past. God does not want you to uh, wallow in your inability to overcome something. God doesn't want you to struggle forever with addictions. God does not want you to uh, you know, drag that uh, ball and chain of depression with you all through life and, and be be. Uh, you know, be uh, hindered by that and be defeated by that and lack confidence, you know, because of that. Because those things over time, they erode your confidence, don't they? They make you feel like, well, man, I, I shouldn't even go to the communion table because, I, I, you know, I can't overcome this. I thought I got rid of this and here it is again. And, uh, you know, all these other things that go through our mind here. And Paul is saying, hey, listen, let the word of God impact you in a way. And you should be praying that the word of God would impact you. Lord, impact my life. Allow me to change in such a way that I'm not just, uh, you know, in the same rut forever and ever. But Lord, let me rise above that. Let me be an overcomer like the word promises that there will be overcomers in the last day. And let me be, let me be one of those here because we've got the message that illuminates Christ. And if it's Christ in me, then I really I've got an advantage over every devil that will come against me. If, if, I, have, if I have Christ in me, then I should really not fear anything at all. But I should, be, I should be able to confront anything with the confidence that it's not only me looking at that problem, but it's Christ also in me looking at that problem. And in the same way that the waters of the Red Sea parted when God looked down through the pillar of fire, I believe that God's able to make the waters part today, uh, you know, in the problems that I face and the wave of darkness that I face and the, and the sea that surrounds me. I believe God's still able to part the waters and let me walk through victorious and sing and dance on the other side on dry ground. I believe that God's able to do that today. And we ought to be praying and say, Lord, rather than just another sermon, just trying to stay awake and just trying to figure out where we're going to eat lunch, Lord, make this word a living reality to me and let it become light in my soul that I, I, I just got to find somebody to tell about it and I, I want to be salty and I want to share it and I want to spread that light and I want to be somebody that uh, somebody can actually be guided by the way I'm walking because that's what lights are they're guides that somebody else would want to follow the way I'm walking because they when they get around me they can see better I'll tell you what, when, when people got around Jesus, they saw better. They saw better what Moses really meant. They saw better what David really sang about, right? They, they saw more what Daniel really referred to when they got around Jesus. They could see better. Isn't that true? May God, may God illuminate our hearts so much that people get around us and they can see better and understand better. Hey, whoa, whoa. If nothing else, we're living in the end time. We ought to make some changes here. We ought to find a church. We ought to get our lives in order. We ought to get, uh, you know, get to a right kind of a church. We ought to get out, blow that dust off the Bible. It's, it's because they're in the light is the, is, is, because, is, is the way that they see better. Because they're in the light, lets them see better. Wake up. We are the light of the world. As the word becomes flesh in us, we're the light of the world. You say, Brother Barry, I make too many mistakes. Hey, um, I've seen some pretty ratty light bulbs in my, my time, uh, you know, that are old and they're, they got stuff on them. Things have half melted on them. Flies have burned on to them. But they're still light. Still do their job. 
<laughs> I don't know. Have you ever seen lights like that? I've seen, I've seen lights like that then. In our, in our growing up years in, in, in Canada, and, and you know, the, the ice would form over the lights, you know, and then it would melt a little bit and have icicles and be all surrounded by, uh, by snow and ice and everything else. And it was just amazing. It was still a light. You could see better when you got next to it. I would pray that somebody, somebody who's in darkness, would get next to me and say, I, I just, uh, somehow or another, I have a, a, a greater peace, I have a greater understanding, I have a greater, greater awareness of things when I'm around. People, people ought to be able to come in this church. People ought to be able to fellowship with us and say, there's just something that you shed, there's something that you emanate, there's something that you project that I don't get at other places. And if we cause that in somebody's life, I'll tell you what, you're fulfilling what Jesus prayed would happen. You're the salt of the earth, and you're the light of the earth. And lights belong in a tall place so everybody can be illuminated. That's what we want to be. Well, let's, let's study that. Let's look at that. Let's stand to our feet. Let's stop there. Let's have our musicians come because we're running out of time here. And <clears throat> But we've got to walk in the light as he's in the light. Then we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Whenever you think about this, remember, remember the Marriott Hotel. It had something inside that did not, did not care what was going on on the outside. Right? The Marriott Hotel had a power within it that was unaffected by the darkness that controlled the world. I want to live a life, me, I want to live a life that is not controlled by the forces of darkness. I want to live a life that I don't care if everybody around me uses foul language. I got a power in me that rises above that. I don't care if everybody around me disbelieves this word. I got something in me that's burning that, you know what, uh, it's real. And, and it's brighter than any of that darkness. That's a, because if you let it, the powers of darkness will rule this entire world. It is here to rule the world. That's what the darkness is for, is to rule this world, right? Because we live in, I mean, he's the god of this evil age, and Satan is here to, uh, you know, to take it all under his control. That's his, that's his plan, right? But God has left you here like a Marriott hotel. He's left you right here, and the whole world being engulfed with darkness, and you're saying, it doesn't matter. Someone thought of this whole scenario before now, and you know what? We've got light. We've got air conditioning. We've got our cafeteria open. Just remember now, just remember, you're a Marriott hotel as you, as you progress through this darkness, and I believe it's going to only get darker and darker. But remember this, that Bill Marriott and his family, they're all Mormons and you don't want to be that. All right, so let's, let's sing a little bit here tonight. <clears throat> Open my eyes, Lord. Open our eyes, Lord. Let's sing that. See, right? Open. No, I, I'm, not, I'm not telling you. I'm asking you. What key? D? D? Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus To reach out and touch Him And say that we love Him Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see. more time.
Lord Jesus, if we would make that our goal, I believe, Lord, I believe that would not only please you, but Lord, I believe it would change us if we lived our lives in such a way, Lord, that everything we did, every step we took, we had the spirit in mind. We had that dove in mind. And we would do everything, Lord, not to grieve that Holy Spirit, but Lord, we would be gentle and quick to forgive, quick to show grace. Father God, we we are so grateful, Lord Jesus, that you have shown such a great light in this last day. Because, Lord, the world is darker than it's ever been. And Lord, we believe you have ordained a finish line that's out there. And by God's grace, we'll find it, not because we figure it out, but because you have shown us the way. Your light is a great thing. And, Lord, I, I believe that you want us, oh God, to take the word into our hearts in such a way that it would really reflect itself. We don't have to try to pretend. We don't have to try to convince people, Lord, but the light that is within us is a, it's just a real living testimony that it's more than just us, but it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. And Lord, we're praying now that you would just forgive us of our weaknesses and our areas of failure, Lord, and I pray, oh God, that you would minister to every family that's represented here tonight. Lord, in all these requests, and we bring them before you again tonight, Lord. Think of Brother Yvonne Carrion's granddaughter, Lord, 17 years old and just struggling in the way that she is, oh God. We know that's just the hand of the enemy that would cause that birth defect to be there. Lord, we just pray for her healing. And Lord, we hold up people like Brother Elias, Lord, who lost his brother and experiencing a great loss. And Lord, may you bring comfort to him as you promised you would. Lord, there are many needs among us and I commit them to you, believing, Lord, that you do care about how we progress through this whole journey. Have your way among us, I pray. Bring us back at the appointed time. Bless our week and may, Lord, we be salt and light. In Jesus' name we pray. Thankful for the light. I'm glad I know this, that God is good. Nothing's impossible with God. Everything was settled at Calvary, and I'm his son. I, I'd never know that unless God showed me that. God is good. Nothing's impossible with him. Everything was settled at Calvary, and I'm his child. Therefore, we can face tomorrow. God bless you. Good to have you tonight, and thank you for bearing with me. Let's sing it as we go. Uh, tonight and let's make this our parting prayer tonight God bless you pleasing oh let me be pleasing to you let everything that to you.